as at the library. Uh, happy to see new faces here. Uh, jazz at the library is a joint venture between Jazz Fresno, uh, we're a nonprofit that promotes jazz in the valley through educational performance, and the Fresno County Library. Co sponsors include KFSR 90.7, that plays a lot of jazz. It's a university radio station, and Woodward Park Friends of the Library. Um, so tonight, let me first introduce, uh, before I introduce our presenter, Rick Helzer, who's on keyboards. We want to <laughs> All these musicians have just made this program what it is because of their, um, you know, their talent, and Rick has given several presentations himself. Uh, John Walthenberger on bass. John. Where's Gary hiding? Oh, right here. Stand up, Gary. Gary Newmark. I'm pleased to introduce Tony Monharis. Uh, Tony is our presenter for this evening. He is an educator, a vibrant harpist, and guitarist. He's been in the valley his whole life. Um, at the age of 12, he taught himself to play the guitar. Mostly, you know, watching his uncle play at family gatherings. Um, in high school, uh, he taught himself to play the marimba and was a member of the very first Roosevelt High School marimba band in 1969. Uh, Tony has led and formed a number of groups, and in those he's played. Um, of course, the guitar, the vibes, and the, uh, the bass guitar, not all at the same time. And I played in a variety of styles, jazz, classical, pop, and of course, Latin jazz as well. Um, Tony uh, is an instructor at Beyond the Beat, a local youth jazz percussion program, and uh, he teaches guitar, bass guitar, and mallet uh, instruments uh, Jackson tried to sit in with a bebop band at the club in New York's 52nd Street. The club owner wouldn't even let him in. Dizzy Gillespie had called Charlie Parker up and told Charlie that if I ever came down, he should let me play, recalls Jackson. Bird was working at the spotlight on 52nd Street. I went down to sit in and took this little set of vibes that looked like an ironing board. I could just fold it up and put it on and carry it around. The manager of the club said, man, what is that thing? Get that thing out of here. <laughs> he and Bert got into the biggest argument. Bert told him, Dizzy told me to hear this guy play. I want to hear him play, but, no to, but to, to no avail. Within a year, though, Jackson was performing at the spotlight as a featured artist with Gillespie's big band. And in the years that followed, Jackson elevated the status of the vibraphone from novelty instrument to one that commanded respect in jazz clubs as well as in concert halls. Milt Jackson, born on January 1st, 1923 in Detroit, Michigan, 
the son of Manly Jackson and Lily Beatty Jackson. Like many, he was surrounded by music from an early age, particularly that of religious meetings. Everyone wants to know how I got that funky style. Well, I got it in church. The music I heard was open, relaxed, impromptu, soul music. Jackson discovered at an early age that he had an affinity for music. When I was seven, he said, I could go to the piano and pick out tunes I heard on the radio. He had perfect pitch. Not only did he have perfect pitch, but he had a photographic memory. He could hear a tune and just go and play it immediately. So that was pretty amazing that anyone could do that. But he taught himself to play guitar at the age of seven, and then started piano lessons at 11, and then went on to play drums. In high school, Jackson, Jackson's band teacher encouraged him to learn to play the, uh, the marimba and the xylophone. Then, in 1940, Jackson saw Lionel Hampton at the Michigan State Fair. Seeing Hampton, he said, is what really inspired me to play the viper harp. He had people in his, in his band like Illinois Jacquette, Joe Newman, Charles M Mingus. I was so inspired by that band and by Hampton that I decided to play the vibes. At that time, Hampton and Red Norville were virtually the only two vibraphonists that a young musician could emulate. But Jackson says he was never inspired by their actual styles. He says, I was already in an, into another direction, which was heavily influenced by Charlie Parker and Dizzy Gillespie. I found that it was better for me to use two mallets rather than three or four, because playing dynamics is very difficult using three or four mallets. And uh, he said I could play with three or four, but he, rather, he, he, he enjoyed playing with just two because he liked to play really fast. And um, so that's how he developed that. One characteristic that set Jackson apart was the slow speed of the instrument's oscillators. Compare that with the much faster speeds used by Lionel Hampton. The more subtle vibrato added warmth to Jackson's long tones, especially and generally made the instrument less nervous sounding. It was a rich, warm, smoky sound with a vibrato that approximated his own singing voice. Jackson was a singer, and so when he, he tried to get the vibe to sound like, it, like a human voice. Stefan's hair says he came closer than anyone else on the instrument to making it sound like a human voice. It's a collection of metal and iron. And we don't have the ability to bend notes and make vocal inflections like the saxophone. But Milk played the instrument in the most organic way possible with a warm, rich sound. He set a precedent that this instrument can speak beautiful things and that it's not just percussive. So I'm gonna demonstrate this really quick. So here's how the instrument sounds with no vibrato. Kind of a plane. Then with the vibrato on and at a very fast speed, this is what Hamp used to use. But he slowed it down and made it more like a human voice. In 1942, Jackson was drafted into the military and served two years in the Army. When he got out, he returned to Detroit and tried to catch up with all the music he had missed. From staying up until six or seven in the morning, I had little bags under my eyes, Jackson remembers. So the bass player in the group that he was playing with gave him the nickname Bags, and it just stuck. <laughs> In 1945, while on tour, Gillespie heard Jackson play at a jam session at the sound station, it's a little bar in Detroit, and was stuck by Jackson's prowess on his instrument. Milk became a member of his group as a probable replacement for Charlie Parker, who was erratic at best in his ability to show up for gigs. <laughs> Unfortunately, you all know about Parker, that he was heroin addict and was unreliable, it was a sad, sad story, of course. Mill received a lot of exposure upon joining Gillespie 
uh, Gillespie Group and helped the group become the era's leading modern jazz ensemble. Also in the group at the Spotlight Club in New York were bassist Ray Brown, pianist Al Haig, and drummer Stan Levy. While the group's personnel changed over the next months, Jackson remained a trusted member of the group. Jackson would later state that Gillespie's philosophy in music, on music and life offered a more evolved mindset in the progression of jazz. He was very, very respectful, uh, respect, he re very much respected Diz Gillespie and how he was an extraordinary leader. And a lot of people looked up to Diz Gillespie for that. <clears throat> Two months after the engagement at the Spotlight, Jackson played piano on the group's big band recording of composer da uh, Todd, Tad Dameron's Our Delight and played vibes on, on the song Things to Come. The following year, Milt joined the group on Anthropology, A Night in Tunisia, and 52nd Street, which have since become jazz standards. Jackson also recorded Umbop Shabam, that's Earl, and one bass hit with former Gillespie saxophonist and drummer, Kenny Clark. In 1947, Jack Jackson left the Gillespie group and, became a, uh, and began a professional relationship with pianist Thelonious Monk. With Monk, Milt recorded steadily for Blue Note, and over the next two years, accompanied by bass John Simmons and drummer Shadow Wilson, Jackson and Monk recorded the songs Evidence, Mysterioso, uh, Epistrophe, and I Mean You in 1948. A few years later, Jack and Monk recorded Ask Me Now, Crisscross, 4 and 1 with Al McKidden and drummer Art Blakely. So we're going to play right now a couple of those songs. We're, the first one we're going to do is uh, Mysterioso. And when you hear it, you're going to know why it's called Mysterioso. Very Mysterioso. <laughs>
Jackson fell into, into a pattern that led to the founding of the modern jazz quartet. Gillespie maintained a former tradition with a small group within a big group. And this included Jackson, pianist John Lewis, bassist Ray Brown, and drummer Kenny Clark. Kenny Clark, by the way, considered the pioneer of the riot symbol timekeeping that became a signature for Bob and most jazz to follow. Is that right, Gary? Yeah. How did it sound? What did, how, what did it sound like? <laughs> That's it. <laughs> so while the brass and the reeds were taking a break, these guys played. When they decided to become a working group in their own right around 1950, the foursome was first known as the Milk Jackson Quartet, then becoming the Modern Jazz Quartet in 1952. By that time, Percy Heath had replaced Ray Brown. Ray Brown was married to Ella Fitzgerald, and he was making more money playing with Ella than he was with these guys. <laughs> so Jackson said in an interview, I heard him say, he said, we just couldn't afford Ray, so. <laughs> but he said, don't tell Percy that, because Percy was very sensitive about all of that. So. 
Known at first for featuring Jackson's blues-heavy improvisation almost exclusively, in time the group came to split the difference between these and Lewis's more ambitious musical ideas. Lewis had become the group's musical director then by 1955, the year Clark de uh, departed in favor of Connie Kay. Boiling the quartet, quartet down to a chamber jazz a uh, chamber jazz style that highlighted the lyrical tension between Lewis's manner but roomy compositions and Jackson's un unapologetic swing. Much of the group's music was in the conservative bop style ref uh, con uh, referred to as cool jazz, and Jackson was regarded as the group's primary soloist. Many contended that MJQ, which is Modern Jazz Quartet, rightfully stood for the Mill Jackson Quartet. Group, group also performed and recorded a significant amount of third string music, which combined tensions of European art music and jazz improvisation. The group wore tailored suits and practiced every aspect of their pre pub, uh, public presentation, from walking on stage to making introductions to the powerfully subdued arrangements in their playing. They wanted to bring back to jazz the sense of high bearing that had been losing popularity of the big bands was slipping, and uh, that was popular with the big bands and it was slipping, and jazz became more of a predicated on the casual jam, jam session. Through two decades of immaculately conceived and recorded albums on Atlantic Records beginning in 1956, their vision was borne out. Initially, they found that audience were somewhat startled by the authority of their quietness. Eventually, the group would become would be one of the few jazz bands embraced by an, uh, an audience much wider than jazz fans. The album Django was first released on LP in 1956. The actual sessions of the LP took place in June of 1953, December of 1954, and January of 1955. And as label Prestige Records had yet to enter the LP era, these discs were released on 10-inch records. The first session in, uh, consisted of Qu uh, Queen Fancy's Delancey's Dilemma and Autumn in New York. It took place in New York, but subsequent, the subsequent New Jersey sessions were engineered by Rudy Van Gelder, and, and eventually the whole album was reissued in 2006 as part of the Rudy Van Gelder Remasters collection. The song Django, like other original material on the album, was composed by the group's pianist and musical director, John Lewis. It is one of his best known compositions written in memory of the French Belgian gypsy guitarist, Django Reinhardt. And we're gonna play that for you right now.
1950s, Jackson performed with the Modern Jazz Quartet and simultaneously recorded as a solo artist. Mill collaborated with saxophonist Coleman Hawkins and Jimmy Heath and trumpeters Art Farmer and Harry Sweets Edison. In 1954, Milt appeared on trumpeters Milt Jack's uh, Milt Miles Davis album Bags Groove, which took the Vibus name Bags for its title. 1959, Milt and saxophonist John Coltrane recorded the album Bags and Train, featuring pianist Hank Jones, bassist Paul Chambers, and drummer and drummer Connie Kay. The album would be the only joint venture between the two men. And on three little words, Coltrane influences Jackson as evident by the harmonic complexity during his solos. The two men truly complement each other and achieve a perfect balance between the two instruments. And if you get a chance, the YouTube little words with the Modern Jazz Quartet is just absolutely beautiful. One of the things too with Milk, he, he could adapt to any player. He could play with Oscar Peterson and play another, uh, play one way, play with John Coltrane and play another way. The guy was brilliant. He was a magnificent uh, musician in that sense that he could just play with anybody and sound amazing all the time. In the late 1950s and early 60s, Milt continued to collaborate with several artists, including pianist Ray Charles, in 19, and in 1961, Milt recorded the album Bags Meets West with guitarist Wes Montgomery. Pianist Whit, uh, Whitton Kelly and drummer Philly Joe Jones was on that one as well. And then in 1962, the Modern Jazz Quartet released the album Lonely Woman on, the, on Atlantic Records with a group uh, the group took up the hard task of recording a cover of saxophone Arnett um, Coleman's Lonely Woman. The group does an excellent job of reinterpreting the song, with Milt adding subtle nuances that changes the feel of the original while taining, uh, maintaining its original mo melodic motifs. In 1972, Jackson released the album Sunflower on Columbia Legacy label. The album featured the top talent of the time, including trumpeter Freddie Hubbard, pianist Herbie Hancock, and bassist Ron Carter, and drummer Billy Cobham. On People Make the World Go Round, Milt employs several sophisticated lines that fits perfectly with the funky feel of the song. With the addition of Carter and Hancock's group, Milt's performance is all the more lively and infectious. Milt liked to play blues, in D flat. One, he says, one of my first gigs in Detroit was with a piano player who could not play in any other key than D flat. <laughs> so that's what gave me the insight, being such a difficult key, uh, key, when I would go to town and pick up a rhythm section, the best way for me to find out what they could do was to give them blues in D flat. <laughs> then that tells me right away how far I can go and how far I can't. He also learned from Thelonious Monk that certain keys have a better feeling and a better sound. He once sat down and played a tune in the key of D, and then Jackson sat down and played at the piano and played it in every single key chromatically, and found that it didn't sound the same than when he played it in the key of D. His ability to play in any key was a big asset when playing in clubs early in his career. He goes, oh man, they'd have pianos half a tone or a whole tone out. So I'd have to transpose the play in another key just to match it. <laughs> also part of that training came from going to Milton's Playhouse on Mondays when Dizzy and Bird would show up to a jam. There were a lot of competition and there had to be a way of getting people off the bandstand so you wouldn't have 20 soloists up there wearing out the rhythm section. So they played something like Cherokee and Be Natural, and, or, and Fat Navarro loved to take the blues through every key. Um, when you got over to G flat, A flat, or B natural, that's when their covers would come, uh, come off, so to speak. So in light of the fact that Milt liked to play in D flat, uh, these guys are gonna play in D flat right now for you. <laughs> We're going to try a tune. Uh, it's written by Milt Jackson. It's called SKJ. And it was, 
he wrote it for his wife. His wife was Sandra Catherine Jackson. So this is SKJ in D flat. Go ahead, guys. <laughs>
So the modern jazz quartet had a long independent career of some two decades until the disbanding of their group in 1974, Milt citing financial difficulties as his reason. The breakup enabled Milt, however, to follow his solo career. And in 1975, Milt signed on with Pavel Records and made numerous appearances at the Mont Montreal Jazz Festival. And in 1978, Milt released the album Soul Believer, which featured his vocal skills. He was quite a vocalist as well. In 1981, the modern jazz quartet reformed in order to do a tour of Japan and had continued to perform together on an annual basis since that time, making them the only group in jazz history to have played together with the same personnel for over 40 years. Wow. The group would continue to perform throughout the 1990s, through, though the death of Connie Kay held them back from active touring. In 1983, Milk joined Ray Brown, trombonist J.J. Johnson, and pianist Tom Rainier, guitarist John Collins, and drummer Roy McCurdy on the album Jackson, Johnson, Brown and Company, which was a critical success. And in 1994, Milt released The Prophet Speaks, which featured pianist Cedar Walton and drummer Billy Higgins. Jackson is one of the five most recorded jazz artists of all time. He is also a noted jazz composer. So, uh, several of his compositions have become standard, including Bag's Groove, Bluesology, The Cylinder, and Ralph's New Blues. In 1979, Jazzmobile Incorporated saluted Jackson's 40 years as a jazz musician by presenting him in a concert at Carnegie Hall. Among the many awards Jackson has won are Esquire Magazine's New Star Award in 1947, Downbeat Magazine Hall of Fame in 1980, the National Music Award and French Bicentennial Award, both in 1989, a Lifetime Achievement Award from the Trustees of Italy, and an honorary doctor, doctorate degree at, uh, from the Berkeley College of Music. Jackson was also known for his outspokenness. The reason I wound up being so political because I had a black history teacher in high school. To have a black history teacher in 1938 was amazing. So I've been a rebel all my life, Jackson says. I never agreed with what the system dictated. Most musicians don't have to get involved in politics to make a living in music, but you have to learn about the, the political structure in order to learn what's happening in the world. Some of the things that go on are unbelievable, he said. I just got the copyright back from Bag's group after 30 years. I didn't realize what I was doing when signing over the rights. I thought I was just signing a piece of paper to get a $25 advance. That's what I mean, it's a lack, that lack of knowledge. It cost me a lot of money to learn how things are done because I'm not gonna tell you. Despite whatever business or political problems Jackson had encountered along the way, his music has triumphed. Hearing Mel Jackson perform must be like watching Picasso paint, Olivier act or Graham dance, Don Heckman of the Los Angeles Times said. Like those illustrious figures, he is an authentic original who has invented his own voice. His capacity to bring fire and passion to what is a little more than assemblage of metal bars and tubes it was make, is what makes him a master. Milt Jackson died of liver cancer in Manhattan at the age of 76. He was married to Sandra Whitt uh, Whittington from 1959 until his death on October 9, 1999. So we have a couple more tunes we want to do for you right now, and the first one is going to be Summertime.
he did do one album that was full of bossa novas. And so we're going to do a bossa nova, and it's actually a jazz tune that's usually not played as a bossa nova, but we're going to play it as a bossa nova. It's entitled I Love You. And I want to thank my wife for doing this live tonight. So thank you, Rosemary. <laughs>
Bill Jackson's signature tune.
Rick Kaiser on the piano, John Lassenberg on the bass, my good friend Jerry Neemark on the drums. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Have a great day.